If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. We're bringing in Jennifer Renouf today from Southern Brumbies just to talk about what she does, and that's educating and rehoming some of the Brumbies, and also to talk about the latest discussion about the Brumbies in the national parks. If you'd like to listen, you know, I'm sure you would have already listened to the previous couple of chats that we've had, and the chat now is just, you know, much along the same sort of theme, but just getting it from a slightly different perspective. Just tell you about the motto of International Horse College. Basically, it's people, safety, and horse welfare. So if that's the way you feel when you're working with horses or being around horses, then have a look at the website, internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation, 31352. Now, I'm interested to talk to Jennifer. And are you there, Jennifer? You're welcome to Horse Chats. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for having me today, Glenna. Okay, Jennifer, I'm lucky, you know, I think I'm lucky to get you, lucky to talk to so many knowledgeable people about Brumbies. But before we get started, just so we can get to know you a little bit better, have you got a favourite quote? Sometimes you quote this a lot about you. Oh, okay. Um, there's so many good quotes that I have posted around everywhere, but I think the one that's on my fridge and the one that I look at the most is um, a quote I heard from another podcast, and it's, what would this look like if it was easy? Okay. So that's something I'm reminding myself of a bit. All right. And how do you think that that particular quote has inspired you, particularly with horses? Yes, yes. I think sometimes, it's, well, a lot of times, particularly myself, it can make all the difference in not making things too difficult or overcomplicated. Horses generally are pretty simple beings, but us humans tend to overthink things and we make things really complicated when they don't need to be. So uh, I know if I'm not getting the results, that I am looking for sometimes you can get really frustrated and you try harder and then that it's just a spiral that doesn't lead anywhere so um, if I can just stop and I take a breath and okay okay I might not be able to answer the question as to what I need differently so that this works but I can certainly ask myself what would this look like if it were easy Mm -hmm. and quite often just by visualizing that that will help steer me down the right path to where I need to be. Yeah, hopefully it leads us down the right path for a lot of other things as well. You know, not just you, but certainly to our listeners and and when they're working with their horses. Yeah. Now, your first memories, you know, were sort of with horses, but also with Brumbies because you were one of the kids that was reading Silver Brumby books. I mean, along with me and Black Beauty, Silver Brumby books and Black Beauty were my favourite. But, you know, do you remember that? And did you remember thinking that the Brumbies... You know, is this sort of how you how you went along to find the Brumbies or was there a bit of a gap in between? Just take us from there, from when you started yeah, off reading sure. the Brumby books. Absolutely. So I distinctly remember I was I was just a suburban girl who grew up in Perth. Yep. So you couldn't get on the coast near the beach, so you couldn't really get much further from the high country. But um I uh, I went and saw the Manson Snow River. I remember seeing that with my parents in the movie. Uh, I also, my my father's side, um, they're sheep farmers, and we used to spend a lot of time on the farm in our holidays, and my cousin and I would read the Silver Brumby books, and then we'd uh, go out and reenact it. And then I, uh, quite embarrassingly, used to do the same thing at school. <laughs> <laughs> in primary school, I was that daggy kid, you know, with her girlfriend on the other end of the oval pretending to be a silver brumby, you know, reenacting parts of the, the books that we yep. read. So, yes, that's that's my memories of that. You know, I read a lot as a child. Uh, it helped me through, you know, some of those tough young childhood and pre-adolescent years. So, yeah, they're my first memories of that. Okay, okay. So for someone to be in the horse industry, to work with horses, we talk about them, you know, they've got to be have certain skills, but I'm more interested in the character traits of a person. You know, what sort of character traits do you think 
that someone um, should have before they even start to work with horses or work in the horse industry? Okay, so these are things that I've had to learn and I'm constantly getting better. I don't think they're, they're skills or traits that you um, can perfect. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about you need to have an emotional calmness, a steadiness. So if you've got some drama happening, you can't have that going on. You can't have your brain busy with other things mm -hmm. when you're um, you know, trying to connect and communicate with your horse. You want to be in the moment and be nice and calm. Uh, it doesn't mean being blank. It's a bit hard for me to explain, but um, being calm around your horse is really important. Uh, being consistent. So being consistent in your emotions being con so your horse knows um, what to expect. Consistency in your training is always really important. Um, horses are creatures of patterns and habits. So the more consistent you are, the better results you'll get. Uh, but also in saying that, I think you need to be bold as well. So you want to be brave enough to try something new or step, raise the bar a bit, a little bit, which is what my horsemanship trainer tells me. She said, just raise the bar. If you're getting into a, a dull pat where you, nothing seems to be improving, maybe you just have to be a little bit bolder and stretch that comfort zone for you and your horse a little bit and just go, well, what if I try this? What will happen? And sometimes you'll get an amazing result and you go, wow, I, I'm really pleased that I tried that. I think for me, they're probably the three three skills that are super handy, especially with the, with the Brumbies. Yeah, and I think too when you were saying, I don't quite know how to explain this about the emotional calmness, certainly the consistency, you know, horses are going to be to understand, you give them a cue, they, this means that, that's consistently. But, you know, you said you weren't quite sure about the explanation for the emotional calmness, but horse people get it. You know, they know exactly what you mean mm. that you've done. Yeah. You've got to have that. Yeah, yeah. Now, who's taught you this stuff? You know, who's influenced you? And, I mean, you know, because horse-mad kids don't start off, well, not many, with a horse that's just come basically off the high country. Who's helped you mm. to get mm. you to the stage where you're ready to take on those horses. Okay, so to me, I started, I'm going to backpedal a little bit on your question, mm. just for a bit of background. But I started my horse journey because I didn't have one as a child. I was nearly 30 by the time I had my first horse. Mm -hmm. And he was a lovely old off-the-track standard bred. He was just a plotter. So we, we were the weekend warriors. We just used to trail ride on the weekends. And then... Um, He'd hang out in his paddock during the week and I didn't really do much with him. But um, then I thought I'd get a Brumby, which was kind of a bit of a shell-shocking moment. <laughs> 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 because, you know, you go from an easy horse to something else and you go, oh, wow, now what am I going to do? Yep. So, um, and I had a, a girlfriend suggest I look at a, a horsemanship program that she was currently going through, and um, which was quantum savvy horsemanship. Um, a little bit further down the track, I met Shane and Meredith Ransley, who are amazing people. They've been instrumental in me achieving what I have with my Brumbies. Yep. They've believed in me all the time. They've believed in my Brumbies. They've given me unconditional support, really. Good. And they're just wonderful people, amazing horsemen themselves. Yeah, so I remember the very first time I met them, this girlfriend who introduced me to the, the horsemanship program, she had a, a, some tickets for a clinic that she couldn't attend. I'd never been to a clinic before. It was kind of on my That's goals it. list to one day I'll get to go to a, have a lesson or do a yep. clinic, you know. Yep. And um, so I was just going to go and watch Fence It. And then she, I think her horse might have been lame or something and she couldn't do participate. So she said, take roars would be really beneficial. Mm. Now, Rose, I hadn't ridden her yet. So she was. we were going along quite nicely with our groundwork. But, um, yeah, she wasn't started under saddle. Well, the day that we left, now this is someone who previously had maybe tried a little bit too hard <laughs> <laughs> with their horses <laughs> and, you know, overdone things a little bit. Um, she wouldn't go on a float. So it took us three hours and two horse floats 
to get her on that float. And it was just persistence. There was nothing, nothing too hard. It was just me being persistent and not quitting. And I, because I knew, I knew I had to get there. Mm-hmm. I, I just something in me said, you just need to be there that weekend. So um, yes, we finally got me there. It was up near Kilmore somewhere. So for the first time, I had borrowed a girlfriend's float. I drove my horse with my girlfriend next to me in the passenger seat to this clinic. I'd never floated a horse by myself before. My husband had always been the one to do all our floating. So it was a huge weekend for me. We just did the groundwork side of it on the Saturday and everyone else was staying to saddle up. And I said, well, I'm, I'm happy to just sit and watch for the rest of the weekend because we're not under saddle yet. So Shane Ransley, who was taking the clinic, it was a clinic all about release-focused training, which is their training philosophy. And look, just um, leave it with me at lunchtime and let's let's see how we go. So he did her first ride in the lunch break at that clinic wow. because he had enough faith in me mm. that I was going to see it through and keep going with her. So I will be forever in his debt for doing that for me. He did that just to help me out. There was no financial reward in it, but he could just see that we were in a place where it would work if he did. And she, yes, yeah, we went a lot. We went on from there. Yep. Their relationship means a lot to me. And it, yeah. Now, your first Brumby, was that Roars? Is that Aurora? Aurora, yeah, yes. Yeah. So she's obviously influenced you. Absolutely, she has, yeah. Is there anyone else or is it her that was the main one, do you think? You know, because we talk about people who've influenced this, and they do, but horses do mm. as well. So can you tell us a little bit about any horses, you know, that, that you think should be part of this story? Yes, definitely. So Aurora, my first Brumby, yes, she did. She taught me a lot of the basics. She was my reason for going out there and stretching my comfort zones and studying and learning new things. Uh, and then along the way, like so many horsemen will tell you, Horses have an amazing way of reminding you <laughs> Absolutely. where your skill levels are at. <laughs> yep. You know, you think, oh, you know, I've got this. This is good. It's all good. And then a horse will come along and they'll go, uh, yeah, you're not quite there yet. Yep. So, yep. And it's up to us as horsemen to accept this dialogue with our horses and ask the question, okay, so what do I need to improve from there? Yeah. So um, for me... Probably two horses that I currently have here have been giving me a lot of help with learning to give. So um, both of them, they're, they're very short. So a short horse in the horse world, most, pe- most people listening to this will probably understand it means they've got the lap a lot of forward. Mm. So they'll either, and Brumbies in general, will either stand there and go, no, I don't think so rather than run because biologically and through natural selection they've discovered that they don't need a big long flight distance and they don't need to run a long way to get away from something and expels far too much energy um, especially the high country brumbies they only have to run maybe 50 100 meters and they're in the bush and no one can see them so um, they've learnt through that to just um, big shorter, shorter horses, they have quite distance short, which is good, except that it also gives them pro- the propensity to just go, yeah, no, nah, I don't think so, I'm just not going to do that. And they will brace down on you and just stand there mm-hmm. and um, or brace against you, which in itself can be quite a scary moment because you don't quite know what's going to happen next. Yep. So I've got two horses here that do that. Get... He's beautiful, he's lovely, he's got a mean bone in his body. But he's taught me a lot about just, I just need to offer and reward whatever little bit you can give me. Yes. So there might be a little bit of softness. So I go, yes, that's it. You know, I might get a couple of steps of nice forward trot. So yes, that's it. So it might seem painstakingly slow. But it's the only way with him that I've going to been able to build up that nice, soft, flowing forward horse. Because if I tried to make any of it happen, um, he's just going to be braced and really heavy and not have any fall at all. And then he, um, then they go down the track of injuring themselves because their self-carriage goes out the window and they end up with 
sore backs and tight shoulders and all of that stuff. So giving, oh, when I say that, I mean, you know, you have to offer and then give. You, you're getting to the point where you want to reward it as it's happening. Or they might not have given it to you yet, but it's going to happen. So you need to give then. The other horse, George, he's very sweet and lovely, but he will brace against you. And he's teaching me a lot about my confidence in my skill. Mm-hmm. Um, because I need to, when I pick up that rein and ask for a flex, I need to give and go, yes, you're going to give me that flex. Even though he might not have quite given it to me yet, if I hold it, if I like, clamp down and say, no, you're going to give me that flex, he will put all his weight in and will count a flex. Okay. I need to find a moment of give mm-hmm. to reward. Because there's no point in going, well, he didn't give, so... I'm not going to give you relief because mm. mm. that's not how horses work. <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. So I think that it's, it's such a important skill and one that's really, really yep. Yep. hard to. I think that's what makes horses, um, you know, it's part of the attraction, isn't it? You know, that, that they're all different, but all very yes. similar. You know, they're different but similar. They're... Um, predictable but not predictable you know there, there's always something mm. there that makes them so they're not machines they have their own personality they they do things a little different to each other and then just when you think you've got them worked out the next day they're like oh no that was yesterday <laughs> today's today <laughs> yeah yeah yes absolutely yeah. and I find that a lot with the Brumbies too is they're very quick in their mm. brain yep and they'll get something if you give them it they've got it Yep. They don't need you to go and redo that and reinvent the wheel again for the rest of the week. Yep. yep. So um, it's more if you can get that give right, you can. You don't need the repetition uh-huh. because uh-huh. to teach them that because they've already got it. So um, it's a bit like teaching your kids the ABC. You teach your kids the ABC and then they've got it. You don't have to continually oh. go back and teach them that. Stop. I need to interrupt this chat for a hot off the press notification. That is, that the latest version of the book, 101 Careers in the Horse Industry, is now available and the best news is that it's a free download. So if you work in the horse industry, if you have a plan to work in the horse industry and have a career in the horse industry, or if you know someone who plans to have a career in this fabulous industry, then this is an essential book for you to read now and then keep as a reference as you progress through your career. With over 100 jobs to choose from, you'll probably find at least one that you'd happily do without being paid. So simply go to internationalhorsecollege.com, scroll down to the bottom of the page, and click on the 101 Careers in the Horse Industry button to receive your free career book. Imagine, maybe one day you could be a guest on Horse Chats. What's your um, proudest moment, do you think? You've got the Brumbies, you've got some success. You know, is it just the day-to-day or is there something in particular that um, comes to mind? Um, oh, geez, now that you said that, I can think of a few other things. So from a day-to-day, it's, it's not really day-to-day, I guess, um, if I have a new Brumby in here that's not handled yet, there's nothing quite like that moment mm. when they finally decide that they're ready to connect. Yep. Uh, and they go, yes, I see you, we can do this. Yeah. Well, that is just such a special moment. Um, but other than that, my proudest moment with Aurora would be uh, we went to, we did a rally for the Brumbies in Melbourne a few years ago, and I took her along, and we were at the forefront of the rally as it was going. We rode down Collins Street, mm-hmm. I think it was Collins Street, past the trams, over the railway lines, over the tram tracks and the white lines that is very scary based <laughs> on the beach of the road. <laughs> um, and up to up Spring Street to Parliament House. And she was so good. She was so good for me that day. And I could feel that she, she wasn't sure. I wasn't sure, you know, because there's some I'd anything like that too. But together we were brave. And she looked to me and said, okay, well, if you think it's okay, then I'm okay. Okay. So she, it was just such a special day for us. That's good. Now, what about 
uh, you know, I'm thinking about the Brumbies, you know, is there not so, it doesn't even have to be a biggest challenge as far as a horse challenge, but just uh, sometimes there's people challenges. Um, we're not going to talk about money challenges because we all have that, but mm. a challenge to do with, you know, you becoming and having the knowledge and the ability to train horses. Have you got anything like that that you can say, well, my challenge? Yes. So for me, the biggest challenge over time and particularly in the early days was letting go of those preconceived ideas and beliefs that if you haven't been in the horse world since you could walk, mm. then you're never going to be any good. Yep, yep. And it was, it's was. it been really hard for me to go, you know what, I am just as good as you are. I haven't been around for that long, but I've worked really, really hard in the last 15, 20 years to get myself to the point where I'm at now. Yeah. So I have had a lot of catching up to do, and I'm not going to say that I'm better than anybody. I um, certainly wouldn't say that, but uh, I just, for me to let that go is really hard. Mm-hmm. So that's my biggest challenge. Okay. So... For our listeners, have you got any mm-hmm. tips for them just to do with training, you know, particularly if they've got a Brumby, okay, or even just any sort of training? Have you got a training tip for them? Uh, yes. I think it comes back to what we were talking about with the release mm-hmm. before, um, those quali- uh, and also those qualities that we were talking about for horsemen. But if you can just think about your, your give. And think about releasing at the right moment. It will make such a difference to your mm. training. Yep. Um, if you've got, you know, um, when you first go into a yard with an unhandled horse, if you push it too hard, you can set yourself back so long. Because mm-hmm. at first they can be quite open, especially the young ones. They'll take on board a lot really quick. But if you haven't released at the right moment, you might find that tomorrow you are back to be before where you were the day before. Yeah. And it can take you a long time to get that back because you didn't release and reward at the right moment. Yeah, yeah. No, I can agree that the timing is, is just so important. Yeah. Yeah, and just be open in your heart. Be really, truly appreciate what our horses give us. They're such big animals. They don't really have to do anything that we ask them to do, but they do, and they try really hard. So I think the more we can appreciate that and just look for those little things that they do for us, I think that probably if you can do that, you'd be yep. an amazing horseman. And now I want to talk about brumbies in general. How trainable are they? Super trainable. Okay. Really trainable. Yep. They can be trained to do anything. They will, as a friend of mine said, they'll put their hoof to anything. They'll turn their <laughs> hoof to anything. <laughs> so, um, you know, their only little downfall is the fact that they can be a bit on the small side. But for most people, they will, they're an amazing little horse. Um, they, I think what happens is sometimes people have a perceived idea on where they should be with their training. And so they'll think, right, well, today I need to be here. So they'll go try to get to that goal. Often, yep. Brumbies, yep. and they, Brumbies might, they just go, no, I don't think so. I don't need you as a human. I was coping quite well without <laughs> you. Yeah. So I don't need to go there. But as long as you're – so uh, trainers that have troubles are usually those ones. Yep. Um, I can understand why you can be rigid in your training, particularly if you're using it as a career because mm-hmm. you need to be able to feed your family at the end of the mm-hmm. day. But if um, the more flexible you can be, you still have your end goal in mind, but you might have to be a little bit more flexible in how you get there. Yep, yeah. And be pre- more prepared to work with your horse instead of just getting to that end goal. I think as long as you can do that, okay. uh, you know, Brumbies are fine. Now, we're going to talk a bit about the Brumbies and the management plan of the Brumbies. So do you know much about the management plans, like how the parks manage our Brumbies at the moment? Uh, yes, there is a couple of management plans. For different parks, isn't there? Yeah, yep. So I'll talk about, most of what I'll talk about is for the National Parks and Wildlife Service in New South Wales. Okay, because, yep. Uh, that is predominantly what's in the public's. I at the moment anyway. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but Victoria isn't 
Uh, it's a little different, but anyway, we'll see how we go. So the management plan states that horses can be trapped and rehomed. Yep. So by trapping, what they do is they will put out temporary portable panels, you know, like mm-hmm. cattle panels, yes, uh, in an area, and they'll have like molasses, they salt licks and things like that in there little corrals that they'd make. Basically reasons for the Brumbies to go in there and have a bit of a, yeah, have a, bit that's of a sticky right. beak. Yep. That's right. So yep. they'll come and go for a while until they get used to it and then they'll put like a trap gate on it Yep. and then the horses will go in, release the trap gate and they're trapped. Mm-hmm. So from there, um, parks will come and they have contractors collect them and they can be sent to, hopefully, they get sent to rehomers. So at the moment, all the horses that are coming out of Kosciuszko National Park are being rehomed at sanctuary and rescue groups. Excellent. Okay. Yep. The other thing, that's when national parks actually tell you that they're doing it. Yep. That's just a bit of a side note. Um, they can also, though, on their management plan, they have trapping and cooting. So what they would, would their idea behind that is they'll trap them into the yards and then just shoot them all while they're in the yard. Um, and I'm going to get emotional, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people are. You know, I think it is an yeah. emotional thing yeah. for horses. Yeah. yeah. And, and particularly if you've have, had a bit to do with the Brumbies and educating them and everything else. Mm. But just going back to previously, because you said, mm. well, when they tell you that they're doing it, I think you can actually register to rehome or get rescue groups from the national parks. You know, like I think it's five, five and under. If you want five, but you've got to still prove to parks that you're able to take the horses on, you've got the correct facilities and the correct knowledge to take them on, but then just to give them that initial handling and settling in and and everything. But then people can buy them from you once you've done that work. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes, mm. that's spot on. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, you can register as a rehomer yep. um, with the national parks and then... So you'll be on their database mm-hmm. to um, apply to take the horses. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then they'll they take them. They all have varying little ways that they that they manage them themselves, but they will look after them, give them basic um, veterinary treatments, mm-hmm. feed them up, get their initial handling done, and then they'll rehome them. Yep. Mm. Okay, we're about to talk about trapping and shooting. Yes, so <laughs> take a deep breath. So um, they think that by trapping and then shooting them, that's more humane than racing them out on the open range and shooting them. We all know how intelligent horses are, and I don't see how they're going to not clue on to what's going on when they're in the in the trapping yards. Oh. But that's what they've got in their in their management plan. The other other things they do is. They will free range shoot, so they will have um, gunmen go out and in the camo with their guns, and they'll shoot them out on the range. That's been happening in Victoria. They haven't actively trapped horses in Victoria for I think it might even be up to about two years now. So instead, they're just going out and shooting them. As horrible as that is, the worst. Oh, I don't know if it's worse or not. But um, they leave all the carcasses are left in the park, mm. which in itself creates, I feel, a huge number of problems. Um, but they're also, they shoot at this time of the year. And we all know that at this time of the year, the mares are heavily pregnant mm-hmm. and they've got, all got foals that are about to be born. So um, uh, there's a lot of, you'll see a lot of photographic evidence of mares that have been shot, may not be a clean kill, and they've, died aborting a foal. Yeah. Or you'll see a foal that um, hopefully will get rescued because its mother has been shot and died and it's standing there not knowing what to do with itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's really tough. Uh, and the reason so they're at both parks are doing this at the moment. Victoria more so. I, I, I can't say this. I'm not sure when New South Wales last did. But um, I know what is going on. So the other thing which is on the agenda at the moment, which is why this has all kind of come to a forefront, is that they want to put aerial shooting 
by a helicopter back on their management plans. Because it was taken off the management plan, wasn't it? It was around about year 2000 mm-hmm. where they had that experience in Guy Fawkes National Park where they shot horses. It was a terrible mess. There were horses that were badly mutilated, duffed for days. It was a horrible experience. And so they took it off the table and said, okay, they legis- I'm pretty sure they legislated that they would not aerially suit again. And yep. even the RSPCA supported that. Now, suddenly it's part of a humane management plan to use the, the aerial fitting again. They say that it's because there's an extraordinary number of Brumbies within the national parks. Is this correct? Are the numbers correct? You know, like I'm hearing, I think, you know, 14,500 to 23,000 or 19,000, but that's like, that's a lot of numbers for for um, a plan that's got 3,000 horses. Are these numbers correct? No, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, for, for 14,500 to 23,000, that's a very large range mm. <laughs> for starters. But um, since this has all come to light, and you, if you look at the stats, you look at them, you go, it doesn't seem right. For me, I'm not a numbers person. I kind of tend to glaze over when people talk to me about numbers, but you look at the, you know, you go, yeah, it's not quite right. It doesn't seem right to me. Yep. Um, recent, the last two years, there's been two wonderful women who have really looked into the, the statistical analysis that they've done to get to the numbers they have. Um, a lovely a lady by the name of Jo Canning, she's an equine behavioralist, mm-hmm. and, and another lady, Claire Galea. Uh, she's a statistician, they've both looked at the numbers and gone, this is, it's impossible. It's absolutely biologically impossible. There's more like 3,000. Okay. Which uh, is the ideal number, isn't it? 3,000 is the ideal number. Yep. 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 So um, what these ladies found was they're not taking into account horses that have been removed Mm -hmm. or have died. Yep. Um, their sample sizes that they've extrapolated out from are statistically too small, even in their own reports, but still they've used them anyway. And in order for them to get to the numbers that they have reached, um, and this is going to blow the mind of other horse people that are listening, every mare would have to have seven foals every year. Now, I'd really like to know... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's possible. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it just does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. And yet they keep using the same petition all the time to create, I'm going to say, create these figures. Yeah. Okay. I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. yeah. So because what they're saying is, well, because the, you know, there's so many Brumbies, we've got to do these aerial shooting. Even if you go back to the original, you know, you gave me a few different – a, a few different scenarios, and you said the trapping and rehoming because that's the that's the one that we want to happen. The trapping and rehoming, certainly not the trapping and shooting or in, any shooting. So the trapping and rehoming mm. is ideal. What can we do to save our brumbies from being shot? So support the rehomers mm-hmm. and the rescue sanctuaries, absolutely. So you know, if you can volunteer some time, whether that is actual physically being at the sanctuary or helping them maybe with marketing or brochures or phone calls or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, sponsoring horses, they all have horses that from beers that need sponsorship. Um, donating money, donating feed. The cost of feed is phenomenal. It's probably the greatest expense for these guys to have to um, have. Yep. Um and then, of course, consider rehoming a Brumby if, if you're in a position to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you've got kids that want a pony, you know, they make probably not the first pony, but they make a fantastic second pony. Yep, yep. Because um, you do need to have a, a bit of mouse about you and know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also need to have a companion. So, you know, so rehoming is wonderful cause, because – at the end of the day, sanctuaries are going to fill up and they're going to have to start shutting their gates. Yeah. So the more more we can get rehomed, the better. 
Mm-hmm. Um, educate yourself on the situation, so don't take my word for it or someone else's. Go out and look for the information yourself. You know, do the research, make up your own mind, and talk to your friends about it. Share it. Tell the world, <laughs> you know, what is going on. And again, I guess, you know, it's kept quiet. The government wants to keep it under the radar a little bit because it it will lose them votes at the polling booth. You know, it'll lose them votes if they if they make the Brumbies a thing. So I feel because secretly, and I don't understand why it's secretly because it's not really a secret, they want all the horses out in the national parks, without mm. a doubt. Yep. So that's why they think, right, well, we say we want 3,000, but if we shoot them all and then go, oh, oops, sorry, yep. Yep. then they're not going to be terribly heartbroken. Mm. But they can't say that or they won't say that because they know it'll cost them in an election. Yes. So, yep. I, you know, I just okay. support in any way you can. Yeah. This is, this is our colonial heritage, which seems to me to be just, trying to be erased. We can't. There's so much history there. Mm. And and not only that, we're talking about horses. They're living, they're breathing, they're highly intelligent creatures and they're just being inhumanely thought. Yeah. Jennifer, just sort of, you know, like we, we know what we need to do there, okay? And um, I think we've mm. got, got a few links and we what we do on Horse Chats is we have a page for each podcast that we do. So, We'll have a page up and it'll be something like horsechats.com slash Jennifer Renouf. But you can just go to Horse Chats and do a search for Jennifer or for Renouf or for Brumby or, you know, Southern Brumbies or something or other else. But just before we finish off, I'm interested, what from now? You know, just you personally, we've we've got something to do with the Brumbies because we're going to send everyone to the page and get them to click on some links and to complain to some politicians. But what are you doing now with your, you know, with your horsemanship and Brumbies and everything else? I've got lots going on. It's very exciting. Yep. So we all Brumby, Brumby places around Victoria and New South Wales particularly, a lot of them are hosting Meet a Brumby Day this weekend. Okay. So I'll be having one here at home, which will be lots of fun. I'll get people to come and they'll just come and say hi to a Brumby, give them a pat, I'll give them a bit of a demo, show them what Brumbies are like. Mm. So that's this weekend. I'm also um, going to do the same thing at one of our local shows in November. Um, I've got some training coming up in between then, horsemanship training for myself and my horses. So I'm really looking forward to going to that. There's lots happening. I just, okay. And I just keep getting out there and going them off and having some fun. And what about, you know, just generally, we've sort of got a lot about your philosophy um, with horses, with Brumbies, but can you sum up your philosophy into a lesson today just for our listeners? Um, yeah. I could. <laughs> okay. Well, you you know, I mean, it's you, you have done, you know, about um, you've talked quite a lot and you've certainly talked about appreciating your horse and appreciating everything does for you and, you know, finding those yes moments. So I think that's that's probably important. But, yeah, otherwise, how, how can people contact you? What's the best way? We're going to put them on horsechats.com. You can search for um, Jennifer or search for Renouve and when they go into you or Southern Brumbies. But just now, if they're sitting there with their pen, you know, going, right, I want to do this, or sitting on the computer with a Word doc open saying, I want to just make sure that I've got this email and socials and everything else, what have you got for the best way to contact mm. you? Okay. For email, you can always get me on email, southernbrumbies at gmail.com. Super easy. Yep, that is. Yep. Um, socials, uh, mostly Facebook, so Jen Renouf and Southern Brumbies. They're probably the best two ways. Okay. I have got a website people want to go and have a look at. Every now and again, I get literarily inspirational. Okay. And I'll write a blog or something. But, uh, yeah, there's a bit of stuff there too. So So the website, is that Southern Brumbies? Yes, southernbrumbies.com.au. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, I'm still thinking about the philosophy. Uh, I guess just when I was talking about appreciating everything your horse does for you, Find that this moment and appreciate your horse's drive. Perfect. 
All right. Well, look, thanks very mm. much for chatting to us. We will certainly put in those things for people to go forward to. And if you're sort of listening to this when it first comes out, if you can do something pretty much straight away because it closes next week and, um, you know, jump on Horse Chats, have a look, click on the links, go through and find out a bit more information. But even if you're listening to this chat afterwards, you know, still keep following and still keep supporting the Brumbies and, um, you know, see if we can get them so that we can keep those numbers. You know, if it's a good management of 3,000 and they can have some, if they have some removed humanely by rehoming them and they can just do a general, you know, rehoming each year or however often they do it. And if you can support that, then that will be great as well. So thanks, Jen. And um, I look forward Wonderful. to catching up with you again and, you know, seeing how your horses are going. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I've done the Brumby justice today. <laughs> you certainly have. <laughs> thanks, Jen. Bye-bye. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.